2 Timothy chapter 3. I want to read verse 16 and 17. The Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Father, thank you for your word today. I pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray that you would give us an ear, ear to hear and a heart to receive everything that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be uh, seated this morning. Um, I'm so glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, we're going to be starting a brand new series today entitled Holy Habits. Can you say that with me? Holy Habits. Now, we oftentimes think about New Year's as a time of getting rid of habits. You know, maybe whether it's uh, alcohol or tobacco or eating too much or, or, or maybe wasting time on your cell phone or, or being unproductive. We look at it as a time to shed some old things. But um, as I mentioned a, a, four min a few minutes ago, it's also a great time for us to use the calendar to set a new precedent in our life. And so, while I believe there are some bad habits... I also believe there are some good habits. Amen? Now, hopefully, the person beside you brushed their teeth this morning. That's a good habit. Can I get a witness? Hopefully, they took a shower or a bath or used deodorant. That's a good witness. That's a very good habit to have. Um, this morning, I want to talk to you about some holy habits. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at some spiritual things strategically that I think will help all of us in this new year and every year if we would just simply apply them to their life. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about the importance of or the power of daily Bible reading. I want to talk to you about the importance of daily Bible reading. Now, I want you to buckle in this morning. This may not be a shouting message. This may be more of a, a, a teaching time. But um, I know that God will change your life as you get into the Word of God. Now, I want to start off sharing with you a story that I heard several years ago, probably almost 20 years ago. I've tried to track, track down uh, the author of it, and I wasn't able to find it, but it's a very interesting story. There was a, a man who uh, his father was about to die, and this son was a little rough around the edges. He had troubled life. And his dad had done good to, to live a, a holy life, to serve God. He, he had a business and he did all of these things to, to totally just live right. And so the story goes that this man uh, was on his deathbed and they had called the family in. And he had one son, it's all he had. And he told his son, he said, son, I wanted to leave you something that would bless you. So I'm leaving you my Bible. He said, for in it, you will find all the treasure that you need for your life. The son begrudgingly took it. When he got in his truck, he, he tossed it across the cab. And when he got home, he threw it in a corner. So it happens that about 10 years later down the road, this son was going through a, a divorce. His life was in shambles. Uh, his kids weren't speaking to him. His wife had cheated on him. She didn't want anything to do with it. And beside that, the strain of the divorce brought a bankruptcy. And he was barely able to make his bills. And so what happened is, is that he was having to pack up and move in with a friend because he had nowhere else to go. And when he was loading his boxes, he found that dusty old Bible. And he opened it up to the very middle of the Bible and fell upon the book of Proverbs. And he opened up the book of Proverbs and he turned over to chapter 10 and he saw a, a piece of tape taped to this Bible. And inside of it was a note and a key and this note says son this is the key to my safety deposit box for I told you at my death that this Bible would have everything that you would ever need for life that son went down to the bank he put the key in the safety deposit box only to his demise did he find CDs and bonds worth 1.5 million dollars see he didn't realize he was sitting on the very answer that he needed what's the moral of the story this morning how much treasure do we miss out on in life when we fail to open the word of God come on how much treasure do we fail to receive from the Lord when we fail to simply just read his word folks this morning I'm here to tell you that inside of God's word is a treasure 
It is a treasure house today. And it's very sad because George Barna did a study. The 2022 study obviously have not come out yet. But the 2021 study for George Barna said this. He said the average American only opens up their Bible uh, or only reads their Bible. One out of six Americans read their Bible regularly in America. One out of six Americans read their Bible. Now I want to tell you something, my friend. No wonder our nation is falling apart when we are forsaking the word of the living God. And so this morning, I want to challenge you to set a new precedent, to get in God's word and to learn what he has for us so that we can experience God's blessing for our lives. Amen. And so this morning, I'm asking you to make a commitment to read the Bible every single day day it ought to be as important as brushing your teeth it ought to be as important as taking a bath as reading as as using deodorant as as saving a little bit when you get paid it ought to be as important actually more important than all of those things that before I hear from anybody I need to hear from God God's word is important to us and so this morning I want to challenge you in fact um If you don't have the Bible app downloaded on your smartphone, I want to encourage you to do that this morning. It is a a great resource that has translations. It has audio Bibles. You say, well, I don't like to read. Well, you can find the simplest thing and press play, and it'll read it to you. Come on. There's so many easy things for you to delve into so that you can get the Word of God in your hearts and you can continue to grow in your faith. Bible reading is important. I want to share with you some background of our passage. 2 Timothy chapter uh, number 3. Paul is writing to Timothy, his spiritual son. Now Timothy is not just like a son to Paul, but he's also the pastor of the largest known church at that time. The church of Ephesus. There were thousands in the church of Ephesus. Paul uh, was mentoring Timothy. Uh, Paul was an apostle. Timothy was a pastor whom Paul told him specifically, Timothy, hold true to the word of God. Do the work of an evangelist. In other words, be pastoral but yet win souls. He's telling him, Timothy, I want you to continue to grow. He said, but I'm, I'm charging you. He said, I'm charging you, Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. So in other words, Timothy, as the pastor of the church of Ephesus, his number one responsibility from his apostolic mentor was to preach the Word of God. Can I tell you, I take that very similar this morning. As a pastor, I feel like to feed the sheep, to shepherd the sheep of God, it's important for me to preach the Word. Not my opinions, not my thoughts, not the headlines, but preach the Word of God. And I don't care if anybody likes what it says. Let the chips fall where they may. The unadulterated Word of God was Timothy's task to preach. Paul told him to keep in the Holy Scriptures and to study to show himself approved. This book tells us, First and Second Timothy, so much about Paul's charge to his son where he tells him the importance of the Word of God. He tells him, Timothy, preach it. He said, don't let anybody despise you because of your youth. He says, but, but lead well and preach without, without favoritism. He tells him to preach, exhort, to rebuke, to correct, to, to do those things because that was his job as a man of God. Then he goes a few steps further, and I like where we end up today in 2 Timothy chapter 3. In fact, put that back on the screen. Let's look at it together. Paul tells Timothy this. He says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every work. I want to focus back on verse number 16 real quick where Paul says all Scripture. Somebody say all Scripture. That means that the entirety of the 66 books of this Bible are important to us. There's a, there's a movement that's happened over the last couple of years that it has uh, wished to exonerate us from the Old Testament, to throw it out the window. But actually the Bible says 
that, uh, that the Old Testament serves as an example to us, to whom the end of the world has come. It, it shows us about the patriarchs of our faith and what they lived through, what they walked through. It shows us creation, the character of God. So listen, more than just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are important. Timothy said all Scripture is inspired by God and is what? It is profitable. It is profitable. I pray to God this morning that this church would not be a biblically illiterate church. You need to know the Word of God. It's important. You say, well, Pastor, well, that's, that's what we have you for, so you can tell us the Word. Well, I can preach us the Word and teach us the Word, but the point of that is for you to grow in your own walk with God. Amen. And, 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 uh, and I will tell you the same thing this morning. The Bible's Paul t- said, study and uh, to show yourself approved unto God. Never, everybody say never. Never take the word of a preacher just because they're a preacher. And I'm telling you that as a preacher. I'm telling you that I am fallible. Flesh. Now, m- m- most of the time in our own carnality, the mistakes that we make are not necessarily purposeful but there have been times where I have tripped up a Bible verse and when I was younger I put I put Noah in the well and Moses on the ark come on but don't take scripture at face value just because a preacher said it now that doesn't mean we don't honor our leaders and we don't respect and revere that doesn't mean that and it doesn't mean you treat everything they say in contempt. However, what it does mean is that like Paul told the church to study it out uh, just like the Bereans would study it out. And so, listen, when you know the Word of God, you deception-proof your life. Because you can hear something and you can say, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not what the Bible says. It's important to know the Word of God for yourself. So this morning, I want to help you learn how to not only study the Word of God and read the Word of God in such a way that you read it and gain knowledge, but how you can grow and apply it to your everyday life. And so there are a couple of things uh, straight out of this verse, uh, these verses, that I think are very applicable to us today. For the sake of reading, you don't have to turn there. I do want to read it one more time. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. If you're taking notes, I hope you're a note taker. Hope you are. Because taking notes helps us cognitively and and other things, but I hope you're a note taker. But if, if you're not, I do provide notes for you inside of our church app. But the first thing I want, I want to talk to you about, number one, why it's important for us to know the Scriptures ourselves. Number one, it's because it teaches us doctrine. It teaches us doctrine. Notice, he said, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Now, the word doctrine, it just simply means a systematic chain of truth. The Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, teaches doctrine now when I was young uh, my grandmother went to a Christian bookstore and she bought me what's commonly referred to as a promise book anybody ever had a promise book before they they have the promises of God listed in subjects it says if you if you have anxiety turn it to this page if you have fear turn it to this page if 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 you need scriptures on marriage turn listen i i'm I'm, i want you to hear what i'm about to say i'm a proponent of those those are great for memorizing scripture but they are not great for formulating doctrine because doctrine has to fit within the context of the scripture folks i want to tell you something you can take one verse of scripture and make it say anything you want it to say And all of a sudden, you're in a cult somewhere because you have taken one scripture and you've built an entire empire upon it. Well, doctrine is taught 
throughout the Scripture. And so that's why it's important for you this year to do your best to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, even if it's just a chapter or two a day. Work For some of you, that's too big of a task. Just start with the Gospels. Just start with the New Testament. But start working towards it because it is vitally important for you to know. It teaches us doctrine. I want to tell you something. Doctrine has become a dirty word in some circles. In fact, I would challenge you, to, for those of you who are tech savvy, and you go on YouTube or you go on a podcast app or something like that, and try to go search for a subject and add the word sermon to the end of it. Healing, sermon, baptism of Holy Spirit, sermon, blood of Christ, sermon. I will tell you, you'll find some results, but they're few and far between. You have to wade through hours and hours of self-help and motivational speech and, and fluff to get through some really deep truth of the Word of God. And so it's important for us to l- read the Bible so that we can have doctrine. Why? Because it matters what we believe. It matters what we believe. When you start at the book of Genesis and you read through the book of Revelation, what you see, one of the doctrines that runs through the Bible is you see God's love for His creation. You see God's love for His creation. In Genesis, you see God putting Adam and Eve into a a, a secure place to have intimate relationship and fellowship with Him. Man breaks that. What does God do? God then moves in and creates a sacrificial system where man can have restored relationship with God. Then God puts judges in the land and prophets in the land to govern God's people. Then we move over into the New Testament and see God giving Jesus as a sacrifice for all of humanity. So I can say that God is love because I read the whole Bible and I can formulate that doctrine from Genesis to Revelation. I see it in every single verse God's compassionate care for his people I can read the Bible and I can see God's grace I can read the Bible and I can see God's justice because in the Old Testament, he, he punished w- wickedness and evildoers. And the Bible says that there's coming a day where he will come as the judge of all earth. And he will judge the, both the living and the dead. So friends, listen, when we read the Bible, we, we understand the doctrine of the judgments. We read the Bible and we understand the, the, the divinity of Christ. That Christ was not just a man. But he was the God man, not 50 50, 100 and 100. He was God in human flesh. See, you need to know that. Because there are people uh, that use words just like us. People like Jehovah's Witnesses. They, they believe in Jesus, they use the word Jesus, but they don't believe he was God. They don't believe he was sinless. They don't believe he resurrected. See, if you don't know the Bible and you don't know doctrine, you'll find yourself falling for anything in life. That's why it's important to know this book. Because it helps us in our everyday life. Doctrine. The blood of Christ. The Holy Spirit. The Godhead. The Blessed Trinity. The ordinances of the church. Water baptism and and Holy Communion. Come on, somebody. The fall of man. The salvation of man. We we need to learn. In fact, on Wednesday nights, we're going to start hammering through some of these things because they're important for us to learn. Number two, not only does the Scripture teach us right doctrine. Hold on now. It rebukes us and corrects us. Ooh. It rebukes us And it corrects us. See, what you don't understand is that when you read the Scripture, the Scripture actually reads you. Come on. When you read the Scripture, the Scripture actually reads you. Paul said it like this. He said, when I look into the Word of God, it's like looking into a mirror. And God is is trying to transform us into the image of Christ, His blessed dear Son. And so when we learn the Word of God and apply it to our lives, it changes us and it challenges us. That's why it's important for us to read it. To reprove means to rebuke. 
Now, I don't know. I don't necessarily like to be rebuked. But the Bible says, whom the Lord loves, He also what? He chastens. He chastens. And see, this is why it's important for us to have a systematic approach to Bible study. One of the craziest things I ever heard about was a man who claimed to be very spiritual, but yet he didn't have a good working knowledge of the Scripture. And let me tell you something. People say, well, I'm a word person and I'm a spiritual person. Well, how about you be both? How about you be both? We're called to be the Word and the Spirit. Amen. In fact, the Holy Spirit won't ever do anything against this. So, let's, let's look at this. I heard a story about this man who was going through trouble in his life. And he didn't know how to study. And so he got his little Bible. And he sat down. He said, oh Lord, I need a word from you. Anybody been there? So he flipped open his Bible. Judas hung himself. I don't think that's a word from the Lord. We rebuke that in the name of Jesus. All right. Second time's a charm. Eh, go and do likewise. That's not the Lord right there. That's not the Lord. But a lot of people, we laugh, but a lot of people, that's how they Bible study. They have no, they have no formula. They have no method. They, they just plop open the Bible and just read it wherever their eyes fall. And I, I don't want to negate the fact that the Holy Spirit can use times like that. I'll be honest with you. There are times I've just opened up the Scripture and it just popped right open to what I need. So I'm not trying to put God in a box this morning, but what I'm talking about is systematically studying your Bible so that you actually have a, a greater grasp on what the Word of God is trying to say to us. See, that's the problem that I have a lot of times with some of the promise books with the, with the topical Scriptures because you'll be picking out Scriptures that don't apply to you. You know, you know, in the Bible, there are three classifications of people God addresses. He addresses the nation of Israel, He addresses the church, and then He addresses the nations of the earth. It would do us some good to figure out who God's talking to when we're reading the Scripture. Amen? It's good. But, but so we need a, a set systematic approach to it, but we also need a set systematic approach to it. Watch this. So we don't skip over the parts we don't like. I'm from the South. I've learned that this Oklahoma is, is a part of a geographical location that people don't really claim. If you talk to anybody else in the Midwest, they say, no, Oklahoma's South. If you go to the South, they say, Oklahoma's Midwest. But I'm, I'm a part of y'all now, so I claim whatever you are, that's what I am. But I was raised in South Arkansas. We like the good buffet. In fact... We love some Golden Corral. I want to stop preaching early so I can go eat. Hallelujah. Fast don't start till next week. Amen. So, the problem with Golden Corral is this. You go hungry. You take what you like. You leave what you don't. And the Word of God literally addresses every subject in life. There is not anything that you can go through that you will find absent from the Word of God. Because here's the thing, out of thousands of years of human history, one thing is for certain, humanity and our nature has not changed. And when God used men of old, led by the Holy Spirit, to write the Scriptures, literally everything was covered. Now, but if we don't have a systematic, then we only get the scriptures, scriptures that, that talk about getting a new house. The Lord is going to give you houses that you didn't build and vineyards that you didn't plant. We love those verses. But what about the verse that says God won't give you a house till you quit shacking up in the one you're living in? 
Come on, somebody. What about the verse that says, touch not the unclean thing? What about the verse that says, you're nasty and you're mean and God doesn't like pride? Come on, somebody. And pride comes before a fall. But see, if we don't have a systematic uh, checkpoint of study, we will take what we like and leave what we don't. And the problem with that is, every doctor will tell you, if a child doesn't get proper nourishment, it'll stunt their growth. We have to learn how to take all of the Word of God. Because it not only deals with our peace, but it also deals with our pain. See, the Scripture says if you want to reign with Christ, you also have to suffer with Him. How many of you read that passage and like that one? The Bible is replete with corrections. In fact, book of Galatians was written to correct them. The letter to the Ephesians was written to correct them. 1 and 2 Corinthians was written to correct them. 1 and 2 Timothy was written to challenge and to exhort and to correct. Revelation chapter 1-3, through we have the seven letters to the seven churches penned by John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. All but one church was given a, a standing ovation and the Lord praised them. But the other six, He said, I've got this against you. See, I, I've learned this. The only thing better than learning from your mistakes is learning from somebody else's. Now that doesn't mean we, grab, we grovel and we glory in other people's mistakes. But it does mean that when we read the Scripture and see what the men and women of God of old went through and, and we see the warnings that they had, then they can serve as roadblocks for our life. See, some of us this, this, this year would do good to read a chapter of Proverbs every single day. There are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. Some days they're 29 days, some days they're 30. For the most, they're 31. I heard a quote one time, it says, A proverb a day keeps the stupid away. Proverb deals with loaning money, it deals with adultery, it deals with friendship it deals with i love it i love proverbs 18 24 it says if you want a friend show yourself friendly quit talking about nobody talks to me you go talk to somebody you reap the kind of friends you sow then the bible talks about uh, uh don't let your eyes behold strange women because if you go into her house her husband will kill you that's in proverbs He says, don't look upon the wine when it's red, when it's sparkling in the cup, because it bites like an adder, it stings like a scorpion. It says, says, you say, who hit me? He's describing a hangover. Might be why some people aren't here today. Come on, somebody. But the Scripture rebukes and corrects us. And listen, as a Christian, we need to learn to love the loving rebuke of our Father. I don't get offended when God corrects me. Why? Because it means He loves me. He loves me. He wants to correct me and put me back on the right path. Then the third thing. Not only does it rebuke us and correct us, but thirdly, it instructs us for righteous living. You know, if you you drive a big Chevy truck You're going to get the best work done on it when you take it to the Chevy dealer, not the Mazda dealer. One is a U.S. car, the other is a foreign car. These different parts, different tools, different terminology, different size bolts, different metrics. Uh, uh, Let me just just tell you, when your life needs to go in the right direction, you go to the instruction manual. And you see how God tells us to live. Live. It's important for us to know this. The Bible tells us, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it. That's in Ephesians. He says, likewise, wives, uh, honor your husbands, obey your submit to them, for they, wa- for they watch over you. The husband is the covering for the wife. And He says, honor the husbands and the first fruits of all of your increase. And Paul deals with um, things over in Galatians and when, it, when he starts dealing with um, the, the, the way that we should live and how we should pray. 
Paul tells us in the book of Galatians, writing to people who were Jewish converts, who they loved Judaism so much, they started to be pulled back into the old traditions and away from the freedom that they had found in Christ, knowing Christ had fulfilled all of those Old Testament things. And Paul goes and he encourages them how to live. And I love what he says to the church of Galatia. He says, if, he says, if you're a, a Gentile, you don't need to go and become a Jew. And he says, if you're a Jew, you don't need to go and become a Gentile. What he's saying is to the Jews, you can follow Christ and keep your culture. You can do the feast. You can, you can do Passover. You can do Shabbat. You can do all of those things. But just know that when you celebrate them, Christ fulfilled all of those things. And he's telling the Gentiles, you don't have to put a beanie on your head and throw a prayer shawl over you for God to hear you. All of that stuff was type and shadow. But the Bible gives us instruction for righteous living. The Bible, the Bible, look, Proverbs, I want to stick on this for just a few moments, is so important. Because Proverbs tells us even how to handle, you know, the, the Proverbs talks about lending people money. You know how many relationships are ruined, friendships are ruined over lending people money? The Bible says don't co-sign. It says if you're going to co-sign for somebody, just go ahead and, and expect to give that as a gift. Because if they don't pay, then you're going to be mad. Your relationship's going to be ruined. And he says, beside that, why would somebody come take your bed away, meaning come and repossess your stuff? In those days, they sold your children into slavery, indentured servants to pay off your bills. Why would you put yourself in jeopardy? So the, the Bible tells us in Proverbs, what? To just loan and be generous. Instructs us for righteous living. Tells us to be honest. You know, one of the Ten Commandments found in Exodus says, Thou shalt not steal. Still true in 2023. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Still true. Thou shalt not covet. Still true. All of this morality and instruction in righteous living comes from the Word of God. Here's the thing. As we read the Scripture... It renews our mind to a new way of thinking. Paul wrote to the church at Rome in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. He says, do not conform yourself to the image of this world. One translation says, do not be conformed to the world's mold. You know the world has a mold, right? You know what a mold is. Think of, think of cooking, right? At Christmas time, ladies, and some of you men, you're baking cookies in the kitchen, and you want a Christmas tree cookie, what do you do? You get a mold out. And you pour that, that batter in that mold. Well, the world has a mold. And the world wants to put you in that mold. The world wants to tell you that abortion is just health care. It's just a clump of cells. When you read the Bible, it says, before you were even in your mother's womb, I formed you. When you read your Bible, it says that when the angel, the angel came to Elizabeth, the side was given that she would give birth to John, it said that the baby leaped in her womb. Baby, not sales. The world tells us homosexuality is normal and you should accept it and it should be on Disney and every other cartoon network. But the scripture says that it is abomination for man to lay as with a man as woman does with a woman as, as he does with a woman and vice versa. And Romans chapter 1 says those who agree with such things are just as guilty. So the Bible gives us instruction. But listen, my friend, Hosea the prophet said it like this. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. Of knowledge. Pastor, I just don't have any faith. I can tell you why. This, this is a faith factory. This is how faith is made. You don't believe me? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the what? Word of God. Uh, I can't have faith if I don't have anything to stand on. But God's Word is true. It's trustworthy. This Wednesday night, if you're liking this this morning, this Wednesday night, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start through our statement of 16 fundamental truths and I'm going to show you where we got the Bible from. How we decided on all 66 books and its archaeologic and historical accuracy. It's important. 
As we read the Bible, it helps us. Paul said, do not be conformed to the world's mold, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind. You know how your mind gets programmed? Repetition. Repetition. Repeating. 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 Um, almost all of us have a television in our house. Now, I'm not clothesline preaching because I, I like television. I don't spend all day watching it, but I do have a couple shows that I like. But the word television comes from two compound words, tell and vision. And, and much of what formulates our belief systems today are young people. Not just our young people, older people. It's by spending more time in front of the screen, whether it be the television or the phone or the iPad, rather than the Word of God. Because let me tell you something. You sit down, at, you sit down at, the, at, the, at the couch, the lazy boy, you put your feet up for the day, you know in your heart, as a Christian, you know in your heart as a Christian that, that uh, the Bible is not for homosexuality. But because you really like that show, you keep pushing it off. Well, it's just one episode, it's just two episodes, and then now what? All of a sudden, your mind's becoming programmed just like the world. It's not so bad. It's not that big of a deal. But guess what? The only way to combat that type of negative programming is to get into the Word of God. Get into the Word of God and let God's Word program us and instruct us for righteous living so that we can combat on the day-to-day -day life. You need this Bible. When Jesus was baptized in the Gospel of Luke, it says that Immediately after his baptism, he was driven off into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. He fasted, and the Bible says he was hungry. And after that 40 days was, was over, the Bible says the devil came to him and began to tempt him with things. There are three, three categories of sin, folks. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Three categories all, all sin fits into. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And the devil came and tempted Jesus with every one of those. The lust of the flesh. The Bible says after 40 days he was hungry. I bet he was. If you be the Son of God, turn the stone into bread. Jesus said, it is. No word, no sword. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Took him up to the pinnacle of the mountain. Showed him the kingdoms of the earth. He said, if you'll just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all of these things. Jesus said, it is written, for you shall not tempt the Lord my God. He always had a response for Satan. It is written, it is written, it says. And Jesus used the word to fight against the adversary. It's important because the word instructs us for righteous living is also one of our greatest weapons. Changes our thinking to a new way of doing. And so this morning, I want to challenge you with a couple of things that I think will help you on the daily. And these are not in my notes, but I want to show you a couple of things that I think will be important to you. You may be here this morning, you may pick up the Bible, you may be a brand new Christian, you may say, Pastor, this is overwhelming to me. I want to give you a couple of easy things. Are you ready? The first thing I would do is this. Number one, make a daily time to either read or listen to the Word of God. Every single day. Put a timer on your phone. You know, these phones, my phone's at my seat, but phones are so awesome, I use it all the time. I, I just pick it up and I say, Hey Siri, set a reminder for this. And in a few moments, it'll say, reminder set for whatever I told it to. We, we really have so many tools at our disposal to use to help us. So you need to have a consistent daily time. Here's what I want to tell you. 
It won't just happen. Can I tell you, if there's anybody who does not want you to read your Bible, it's the devil himself. And, and I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a no electronics person. I like to read my Bible and I like to pull it up on my iPad sometimes. There are benefits to both. I like this because I do think it's important to know where the books of the Bible are. If you've never memorized that, go on YouTube and pick up a children's song. They, they got thousands of them and learn the, the books of the Bible. You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You know, go through that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd, Corinthians. Just learn them. Why? That, that way, when I say turn to the book of Revelation, you're not over at Genesis. There is, and by the way, most paper Bibles do have a table of contents in them. But not only do I like paper Bibles for a reason, these things are great. I use mine to study. But unless you turn the notifications off and put it in airplane mode, I promise you, every time you set up yourself to read the Word of God, CNN News, ding! Facebook, ding! Twitter, ding! Snapchat, ding! Whatever you want to ding is going to ding through there. It's going to rob your attention. I promise you, you know, anytime you want to fast, somebody's going to invite you for donuts the next morning. It's just how it happens. So you've got to have a safeguard. You've got to have commitment to do it every single day. You know, they say it takes, what, 14 times? I believe it, if it is uh, to make something a habit. You just need to make it a habit every single day. Here's the second thing. I don't want to step on anybody's toes with this, but this is important. You need to pick a reliable translation of the Bible. Now, let me tell you, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of Bibles out there. There are different schools of thought. There are different ways to learn. Um, you want to find a word-for-word -word translation of the Bible to, to really study from. You understand, and I'll, I'll hasten to a close in just a second. Whoever's coming can come. But, but let me just tell you, the, the Bible was not written in English. That's why I can flat-footed tell all of you King James-only people that you're wrong. Because Jesus didn't speak Elizabethan English. And by the way, the original King James English, could none of us read it so hard. The one we have now is the revised version. The Bible was written in Koine Greek, in Hebrew, and some places it was translated into Aramaic, and some, some transcripts Latin. Well, we don't speak those languages. And so, you need qualified people who know those languages, who can translate those the best way that they can into our language. Now, there are Bibles in all different languages. Uh, in Farsi, there's Bibles in, in English, and in Spanish, and in Korean. There are all kinds of Bibles. But you want to find one that is a word-for-word -word translation that is easy to understand. I preach from the New King James because most people are very familiar with the New King James because it's very similar to the King James without the these and thous. But personally, on a day-to-day -day basis, I read the modern English version. The New Living Version is great. And listen, folks, there are a lot of things out there that are floating around today. And again, I don't mean any hate to anybody. You may have this Bible today, so don't take this as condemnation. But there are Bibles that are out there today that are passed off as translations that are not translations. The Message Bible, the Passion Translation, which is not a translation. One person got inspired to do it, just like Eugene Peterson with the Message. And listen, there have been times in my devotional time, I've opened it up and I've found some beautiful things the way that they worded them the problem was was that Eugene and the guy who did the passion were not qualified to translate biblical language and beside that they worked on the project alone listen you say well pastor they were inspired well so was Joseph Smith whenever he wrote the book of Mormon so were the people who did the New World translation for the Jehovah's Witness Bible which by the way Every reputable Bible lists who their translators are. They don't. 
So I'm not saying you can't use some of that for devotional, but for your scholarly work, for memorizing the Word of God, for really learning the character and nature of God, you need something reliable so it can help you in your everyday life. And here's the final, the third thing that I want to share with you to give you success in reading your Bible. You ready for this? Whatever you're reading, let me just pick a, let me pick a passage. John chapter 3, okay? We, we know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay? That's great. Here's what I'm telling you to do. Read, what, read what's before it. Read what's after it. And in many cases, read the chapter before it and the chapter after it. You know what that's called? Context. When we were in school in English, they taught us something called context clues. So there are a couple of things that you need to ask yourself when reading the Bible. Number one, when was it written? If you got a good Bible in the very front of it, it'll tell you. Two, who is speaking? Was it Paul? Was it Jesus? Was it Timothy? Was it Peter? Who's speaking? Number three, who are they speaking to? Is that three? Number four. The fourth one is important, but the other three are important too. Here's number four. How does it apply to me? How does it apply to me? Because here's the thing. Not all of the Bible is about you, but all of it does apply to you. And so you need to ask those questions. When was it written? Who was it written to? Who's speaking? How does it apply to me? This morning, if you have a Bible, I want to ask you to grab it in your hand. If you've got a digital Bible or a phone, I want you to grab it. I want you to stand on your feet with me this morning. And I want you to hold it up in the air. The Bible says concerning the armor of God and take up the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. This Bible is a weapon. It will deception proof your life. It will arm you for spiritual warfare. It will correct you when you're off track. And number four, it will teach you the right way to live. My altar call today is this.